So here's the first slide. And uh, you remember I was talking about the decision to discontinue Ibogaine. Uh, there was a promise implicit in that, that the other stuff, non-psychoactive alternatives, which yet remain to be discovered, would do just as well as Ibogaine anyway. And um, the important thing about naltrexone bupropion, the important thing about uh, 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 naltrexone bupropion is that this has been tried for about 30 years, the various iterations of the same um, experiment, and it never works. Um, Ken says, why are they doing that? They know it isn't going to work, <laughs> you know? And it's based on the fact that unexpectedly, naloxone turned out to be somewhat effective for alcohol addiction. So they're saying maybe methamphetamine is enough like alcohol addiction that naltrexone will have an effect on it. Well, the effect was two and a half percent. I'll show you a slide in a little while that shows that, well, butrin, which is bupropion, uh, is only 10% effective for uh, detoxing from meth. And by putting somebody on Wellbutrin, which is the injection of the paramorphine uh, preparation, uh, they were able to increase the success rate from 10% to 12.5% which in my book is a failure. And uh, all the stuff that they were talking about when Fauci assured them that they didn't need Ibogaine, that they could go ahead and ignore it. Uh, cocaine vaccines. Uh, stuff that is basically intended to physically stop um, The course of addiction didn't work. But I began, you know, that's the thing that people have not um, focused on enough. I began has physical effects, is very strong physical effects. People who take it say, wow, that, that stuff knocked me on my ass, man. I couldn't get up and move for like 12 hours. So it's having very strong effects on the body. And uh, to, you know, these effects are supposed to be uh, broad spectrum anti-addictive effects. So you, you, you decided I'm not going to use this thing because there's something politically incorrect about it. This is, they didn't know that much in 1996 about herd blockade. That stuff was only discovered in 2014 or something. Um, now, there was a political decision, and the way that they put it was, NIDA doesn't study hallucinogens for treatment of drug addiction. And here's our molecule. Um, uh, now, I don't, don't have this wonderful thing what I would have had in Holland at the Mezrov, which is a laser pointer. And I have to use this little cursor, which is very inferior to like pointing out, you know, things about the slide. But I will try. And the important thing to know about this is this kind of parallels this first part here, the uh, six sided on the left, five sided on the right, seven sided, or seven-sided on the right, um, kind of parallels um, harmony. 
but it's not really because it's the seven and it has this other stuff attached to it, which is like a porch on a house. And uh, that is according to some research by Nash where the stimulant effect resides. But you notice that all these things here um, are three positions are all uh, hydrogen, uh, are two position, all hydrogen, are one position, are hydrogen and um, uh, hydroxyl. Um, here on this 18MC is this other extra carbon, right, in the carboxyl. And what that does is it makes the meth methoxychloroneridine a little too fat to fit in some of the places where ibogaine fits. It does not apparently get to the herb channel because of the hydroxy or the carb carboxyl. But it also can interact with the serotonin transporter. And that's a big deal. And you can't really claim it's like ibogaine because if it doesn't interact with the serotonin transporter, that's a signature effect. And actually, methoxychloridine is more like boacangine which as we know is inert and has to be processed to be turned into ibogaine. Now, um, this is a slide I borrowed, I had a, an earlier inferior slide, but this is where you really need the um, um, laser pointer. There are two nodes here, the VTA and the substantia nigra. They're actually pretty close to each other. And you can think of the VTA as just activity, right? You know, it's uh, going into the nucleus accumbens and the prefrontal cortex. And um, you could think of all kinds of actions that you could be called to do but anything involving a lot of movement, um, running, uh, going to a nightclub, picking up a girl, uh, fight or flight, they all uh, are using this primary um, uh, pathway. Now, the substantia nigra is on top here, and that in turn is uh, tracking what you're doing. And uh, this is the place where you lose um, neurons and dendrites and so on, and you get Parkinson's. And what it is involved in is the circuit where you stick the key into the lock. And as you let, you know, lose your ability to actually find the lock with the key, your Parkinson's is getting worse, right? But this is the tracking function because you need to be able to see what you're doing, right? So you have this one is to see what you're doing and this one is to do it, right? Now, back in the days of Nancy Reagan, they had belief that Dopamine was the pleasure switch. And that if you could control reward, you could obviously leave the, leave the addict around by the nose. But they did this experiment midway through the 80s. I could ask Ken, I could probably find the exact year. And they administered juice to a rat on the tongue of a rat. 
And lo and behold, they got an immediate spike of dopamine here. Well, they conditioned the rat, like Pavlov's dog, to expect the uh, reward of juice with a, a light or a bell or some kind of like conditioning. And lo and behold, the spike of dopamine moved in time and the animal alerted a couple of seconds earlier before the reward because it knew the reward was coming and so this in a way is how you organize your life you know you you know you have to go through a bunch of stuff to get to the reward and you dutifully go through a lot of crap that is not rewarding that you have to go through to get to the reward but you know our entire uh system is based on deferred gratification and the fact that you can condition uh to become aroused and this is what this shows it shows it's not pleasure pleasure is more like serotonin and opiates and things like that it's arousal now this actually makes no sense unless you think of it in terms of sex um but obviously if you don't get aroused sex is no fun now here's a interesting thing it shows a, what's called a tyrosine cascade you start out with tyrosine which is a food and you make uh, different um, versions of the same molecule, and you wind up with dopamine here, and you wind up with norepinephrine here. Um, norepinephrine being for fight or flight, dopamine being for more pleasurable stuff like uh, sex. So, uh, What's important to notice is that you, that doesn't show it, but after norepinephrine comes something called adrenaline, which is a waste product. And off here to the side somewhere, it doesn't show it, is something called GDNF, which uh, actually keys into a receptor called RET, which is a tyrosine um, receptor. So, um, this is good as far as it goes, but it doesn't show everything. The important thing here is though, that um, it cannot cross the blood brain barrier. So all those tales from the QAnoids about Huma Abedin and Hillary Clinton sacrificing infants in the basement to get the adrenochrome, I'm afraid the adrenochrome couldn't cross the blood brain barrier anyway, so it wouldn't work. I'm sorry to explode a major motivating myth of the Donald Trump movement, but they're having a devil of a time getting GDNF into the limbic system. They tried injecting it, they tried uh, connecting it to a pro drug, they've tried uh, putting on a virus. Nothing seems to actually uh, cause a surge of GDNF except Ibogaine. Okay, so here, uh, here is uh, the, wait a minute. This stuff is on here. Uh, so up here is the cortex and the, and the limbic system again, but a lot of people don't realize this, a very important part of your central nervous system is attached to your kidney, and that's the adrenal gland. And the interesting thing is that the entire dopamine system requires constant feeding with GDNF. And without that gene, um, 
knockout mice were not able to grow kidneys. Not only did they not have adrenal glands, they didn't even have a kidney. So the my, my mouse was born and promptly died, you know. Um, gotta have kidneys. Ah, we were talking about sex. So this shows uh, dopamine on um, in a rat who's having sex. And you see he sticks it in over here on the left. It's kind of going for a little while and then it begins to feel good and he arouses and he goes to a new level of pleasure. And then at the new level of pleasure, he goes along and then he gets a spike uh, with the orgasm and they drift off to sleep. So it's the same in humans. And this shows why the feedback loop between pleasure and arousal is very important. You can't get to the top, to the ejaculation without interaction between um, arousal and pleasure. Now, this is fine. This is just great. Until you get to the part where you have psychostimulants and the psychostimulants just throw everything off. And there are two kinds of psychostimulants. Over here is cocaine Ritalin, and that's preventing reuptake, deforming the uh, uh, transporter in such a way that dopamine accumulates in the synapse. But more uh, problematic is amphetamine over here, which is a releaser and causes a continuous flow of dopamine for 12 hours. Now, the effect of both of these is a flash to imprint whatever you're experiencing, it could be anything, as being highly arousing because you are highly aroused. And the effect is that some people can never let go of the first time they did a drug. It's not a huge percentage, but uh, you know, maybe even three percent. Three percent of the population is on um, fentanyl. You have a problem. So uh, the effect is much like uh, walking out of a dark room into a bright uh, sunlight. At first, you're blinded, and that's what happens. This is blinded. Then you know, you kind of get used to the new level of. Uh, Super, super stimulation, but um, if you walk back into that room, it's dark and remember, you're gonna probably trip over the table. Now, I had somebody who actually could read this and he said uh, that these are micromolars. And this was a simple uh, experiment where they were trying to figure out is there a measurable effect of methamphetamine on the density of cell bodies and dendrites? And you see down below, there's a little less, there's definitely less cell bodies, there's somewhat less of um, foliage of dendrites. And uh, a lot of people say, well, meth is just like opiates. Uh, you could do opiates for many, many years and be pretty normal. Uh, what's wrong with meth? Well, actually, it's not the same. Um, you're losing uh, carrying capacity. You're losing your dendrites. You're losing uh, receptors. And eventually, you have desensitization and anhedonia without meth. And uh, this is a big problem when people are doing, uh, taking meth uh, to get, have sex, still have like hot sex when they're 60. Um, uh, now back at the beginning of time, when we were having the argument with Glick, 
about whether the visualizations are important. Um, a guy named Hameroff and a guy, another guy named Pamela Penrose came out with quantum coherence of microtubules in which they said the basis of thought is actually uh, laser light impulses inside of microtubules uh, in the dendrites. That was those, I'll show you again, so dendrites. Yeah, these are dendrites, right? So they're not just in the cell, they stretch out in between cells. But they posited that the coherent light inside of literally billions of dendrites was the basis of thought. And what where this gets to be important is if the visualizations are actually doing something and they're showing you something and you're coming to many, many little conclusions about what you're seeing as you tend to do, then uh, a, they are important to the experience. So what we said was, if the visualizations do something, you're gonna ultimately be able to see evidence of dendritic, dendritic regrowth and re-sprouting. Now here's a, another uh, graph from a woman named Nancy Wolf that shows memories and memories are encoded in calcium. And it's kind of like the prismatic effect of a shell, a calcium shell. And it traps visual memories of what was happening that day. And you have them for the rest of your life. But this is an important thing. Without a chance to turn into long-term memories, they get lost. Um, I had a fatal heart attack that uh, fortunately I was revived from, but I did my, my uh, heart stopped for longer than three minutes and they had to put me on induced coma. And when I woke up, I had no memory of what happened the day of the heart attack, the day I was being transported uh, to prison and ended up going to the hospital instead. Because when you're on induced coma, your calcium chemistry doesn't work right. And you can't make these long-term memories. So what it is, is you're using quantum coherence in microtubules to access long-term memories of what happened before as you're experiencing your soma of the world, right? You're, you're, you're experiencing every moment, the incoming uh, impressions of the world around you and turning these into memories. And so, um, relatively early, this is way before the discovery of GDNF. This is like 1997, 98. Um, Nancy Wolf, working on the hypothesis of Penrose and Hameroff, um, concluded that. Editing of memory, which occurs all the time as we learn more and discover more and modify what we thought we knew into what we know now, involves neurotropins. She's saying there has to be regrowth if you just change your political affiliation. You say, I'm no longer a Democrat, I'm a Green, right? 
So um, she's saying there has to be a neurotropin. These other guys are saying it has to be embodied in um, microtubules. So microtubules have to grow. And I, I went to uh, London and Hattie and some other people put on Hattie and this guy, Nick Sandberg, put on a little uh, gathering and I did a, a little presentation. And I said, you know, if there's regrowth and regrowth is part of recovery, then there has to be a nerve growth, one or more nerve growth factors, but we didn't know yet. And in fact, in a, but that, that, when we did that, it was the end of 2000, uh, they knew about a bunch of relatively short acting receptor effects. And the first, th first thing that was discovered was kappa opiate. And uh, kappa opiate is like uh, salvia. Salvia is very strong kappa opiate. So you have acute uh, dysphoria and uh, you have some um, strange uh, Hallucinogenous, hallucin hallucinatory effects. Um, and uh, it has, you know, in di as dimorphin, right? This is a strange, this is an opiate, but it's a control on the main opiate effect of mood, which is uh, to make you silly to kill pain and uh, to make you have a nice nod, right? Because this is an upregulation and it, uh, it uh, like uh, will pull you out of the uh, opioid uh, effect. And uh, it also is involved with the inhibition of something called adenylate cyclase, which is causing your primary opiate withdrawal effects. And it is downregulating beta arrestin. The beta arrestin affects all uh, G coupled uh, receptors. And uh, it, what it makes it is so that you, um, instead of like reacting to every single stimulus, you react to every other stimulus so that uh, you develop tolerance. And kappa opioid abolishes tolerance, which is very helpful in uh, uh, getting over an addiction. This is the second one. This is the this is the one for um, ATMC. This is what ATMC is offering, in fact, and uh, it's blocking the nicotinic uh, acetylcholine receptor. Um, well, Buford, by the way, blocks another one called alpha four beta two. This is alpha three beta four, and. Uh, Alpha-3, beta-4 is more useful because it's in the limbic system. It's uh, uh, actually directly working on the habenula interproductive uh, pathway, which is uh, kind of, you remember that long stretch of uh, ventral tegmental axion? It's kind of interspersed with the ventral, ventral tegmental axion. And, uh, they thought it was going to be great. I uh, hate to tell people this, but um, HTMC has failed again. They uh, got no result. Uh, they had to increase the sample size of the trial, and it is not acting the way it's supposed to act in blood plasma. But I don't have a complete um, 
uh, complete readout on that yet. However, once again, the latest uh, kind of report is a little depressing, considering that this stuff blocked uh, our development of Ibogaine for 20 years. And um, I used my limited political capital to somehow help Ken Alpert get Phil Skolnick appointed as the head of NIDA MDD in um, Frank Bocci's old spot. Um, and he spent $6.2 million on uh, developing ATMC synthesis for my men. <sighs> oh, well. This is actually beginning to get into the really interesting part. We didn't understand this because when Deborah Manish first said there's this metabolite and acts like sticky Prozac, we didn't know what she meant. But what it is, is most um, serotonin reuptake blockers, and there's a bunch, there's Prozac, right? Uh, or cocaine, freeze the transporter open in an extracellular confirmation. It's open outward, right? Uh, and it stays frozen there, and it can't, like, suck in uh, serotonin. Ibogaine, on the other hand, uh, closes it at the top and it's open in the bottom in an inward conformation. Now, how this was uh, uh, accomplished, we'll, I'll get to in a minute. But uh, um, this is like really important because um, this is the thing that uh, Ibogaine does and the Ibogamine and the and 18MC does not. So, there was a guy named Nestor who wrote a, kind of a hatchet job about Ibogaine. Um, and he tried to explain how Ibogaine might work if there is no nerve growth factor. And he put it down to the interactions between acetylcholine, dopamine, and serotonin. And he says, noribogaine stimulates neurons in the avenula that produce a neurotransmitter acetylcholine. This chemical inhibits the activity of dopamine neurons further along the addiction reward relay circuit. Um, that's not what it's doing, I'll get to what it is doing, but it is not inhibiting so much as kind of deprogramming. Because remember, the little uh, animal was programmed um, to, with a, with a light or a bell, to expect the sport of juice, right? And if that animal can somehow learn through processing of data, which is what acetylcholine actually does, then um, it will no longer have that uh, uh, cue. And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to get rid of cues uh, in, in, in addicts' uh, cerebellum, actually. Now, this is dopamine. Addictive drugs stimulate the uh, dopamine-producing neurons in the substantia nigra and the BTA, nor ibogaine, which binds to the receptors in these neurons. It doesn't say which receptors it binds to. Inhibits dopamine release and, 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 and limits its effects on other areas, including the abenula relay station of the addiction circuit. See, this is a lot of this is depending on click. Well, um, the way it's inhibiting dopamine release is through uh changing memory and you know the dopamine release no longer is necessary so it's not dampening it and that was a mistake too uh, which we'll get to in a minute and then finally it says doors uh, serotonin the dorsal and medial rapid areas have neurons that pr produce the neurotransmitter serotonin 
noribogaine incites these cells to send more serotonin to the substantia nigra. The mechanical slows the activity of dopamine making neurons. Um, again, one, once again, that's not exactly the case. Uh, what's happening is there's more serotonin in the system, period, because you're not sucking it into the serotonin transporter. That serotonin transporter is frozen in the case, you know, like every other uh, SSRI, and it's not uh, sucking. So the serotonin is hanging out. But uh, if, yeah, I don't know whether you can even characterize it as uh, slowing the activity of dopamine making neurons, but I guess that's the effect downstream. But nowhere in this uh, slide does it make any reference to a nerve growth factor. This is all supposed to be short acting effects that added up together have a long acting effect. And it does not explain how that could be. Uh, sigma two receptor activity. Um, uh, was previously thought to be an opioid receptor and it interferes with balance. Uh, it can actually cause dangerous repetitive uh, vomiting at about 1% of ibogaine treatments. It's Im implicated in tardive dyskinesia. You've probably seen the uh, ads on television for the anti-tardive uh, uh, med that you could take so you could keep taking your uh, corrosive uh, paliperidol or thorazine. And it blocks NMDA toxicity. But uh, we actually, you know, nobody wants people to get sick. So this was uh, like a good thing about HTMC. It doesn't have this. Okay, so uh, uh, it does stop NMDA toxicity. And this is NMDA. Okay, this was originally thought to be, you know, remember that I was telling you Phil Skolnick became the head of NIDA Medications Development. He earlier did a couple papers on Ibogaine and um, NMDA. And that stands for N-methyl D-aspartate. And there was a guy who was looking at aspartame to see if it could uh, uh, possibly be the cause of some cancers. And he became uh, really interested in Ibogaine and he patented Ibogaine for stroke because like the anti-stroke disosylpine, which uh, this was discovered by uh, uh, Popek and Shimonek, like uh, the um, disosylpine, uh, it comes along and stops the stroke. When you have a stroke, um, you get a little clot that cuts off food and oxygen for some part of your brain. And the uh, part that's cut off becomes very, very uh, distressed and starts putting out a lot of glutamates. And these glutamates go to the next cell and uh, what the glutamate does is it opens up this channel so the calcium can come in. And you get um, uh, cascade effect where uh, the stroke spreads in the brain. Well, disosopine and ibogaine come along and shut down the uh, calcium channel, and they will stop a stroke in mid-stroke. And so if you really had a problem and you didn't have anything else, it's Uncle Joe was having a stroke, and you happen to have angel dust or ketamine, 
you could give ketamine and it would stop the uh, progression of the stroke. But the part that they were really interested in is it, stop, it cuts opiate withdrawal and super sensitization to stimulus, which is an effect that ketamine has. And um, it may also decondition some of the other um, uh, glutamate pathways that are involved in addiction. So, um, what I said in London was you need some way of rebuilding all this stuff inside the neuron. So, this shows the stuff inside the neuron that has to be rebuilt. And you need to be able to let in a little bit of calcium, but not too much, just enough for the cell to actually use it because it doesn't have enough in intracellular stores. There's a lot of intracellular stores, but a lot of it is tied up um, in the form of uh, microtubular, which is uh, calcium. So you need, uh, you need to be able to get some from outside. And that was what I said in London. Um, but this gives an idea of the kind of architecture you kind of send those little guys in and rebuild. And here is how you do it. So there was another group of people that was not connected to anybody uh, at the University of California, Emory. It was a woman named Dorit Braun and a woman named Patricia Yannick or something like that. And they uh, said, well, GDNF stops addiction to alcohol. Uh, and we're seeing some strange effects with Ibogaine. Maybe GDNF is being expressed by Ibogaine. And they went ahead and here's their slide. You see, these are these uh, neuroblastomas. Uh, on the left, their first uh, kind of like a bunch of guys standing around in the prison yard. <laughs> it's like a lot. I mean, they're, they're not talking to each other. Then over here, you, you have the GDNF secretion that apparently is caused by very little ibogaine, and they're all wired up and talking to each other within about 48 hours. So um, you can see this is causing. Uh, rapid dendritic uh, resprouting, and uh, that is what you need. And there is the solution to the uh, GDNF uh, for the uh, identity of the uh, uh, neurotropin. Uh, there's a couple of others that are very important. Uh, BDNF, which is brain-derived neurotropic factor, that's the one that you get from uh, Prevergen and uh, NGF. So those three together, uh, apparently uh, just a ticket to cause this kind of re-sprouting in your own substantia negra if you happen to be uh, somebody who needs it. And here, this shows uh, a different uh, illustration, but the same effect, you get a spike in just six hours and it goes from pretty close to zero Pretty high up, uh, a 12, 13 uh, fold increase. Now, this is a little more complicated because this is actually two slides together. Um, but ordinarily, GDNF comes along. You ha always have a certain background level of GDNF in the body, it uh, connects to a receptor which activates a tyrosine, uh, uh, downstream tyros tyrosine uh, receptor called RET. And this, this is simplified. It goes through about 20 steps, actually. And it gets down to uh, a core element-related binding protein, which actually is able to hook into the nucleus and express GDNF. Uh, messenger RNA, and that comes out. Now, this is what happens over here. When it comes out, uh, it goes through a couple of like uh, little sacks that basically it gets cut up and trimmed and turned into um, a neurotropin, which goes into a, 
a large core, uh, a, a large core dense, well, it's a large core vesicle, and it, it basically gets squirt out uh, GDNF into the intercellular space. Now, it's interesting, regular. Um, neurotransmitters like dopamine or serotonin are actually synthesized right at the cell surface. So they don't have to go to the nucleus. Um, you have a lot of neurotropins and you have a lot of peptides in your body. Um, I'm not even going to try to like uh, talk about the others because they, you know, it's not that relevant. But it is notable that uh, uh, not all neurotransmitters uh, originate the same way. Now, what they found out, the first really important thing they found out, uh, actually is the second study they, they published. Uh, this graph is from that. Um, it says that Ibogaine's role in GDNF upregulation is still unclear, but independently of any other neurotransmitter mechanism, upregulation occurs only with systemic, not only with systemic exposure, but direct microinjection of Ibogaine into the PTA. But this is the important thing. Ibogaine is not active at the GDNF receptor. Somehow, the effect is getting into the cell without going through the regular door. This is a, a, a pathway here. This is a door to get into the cell. And this is what your GDNF uses. Ibogaine is getting inside the cell and uh, affecting a cascade of effects that goes from the cell surface down to the nucleus and switching that on. Um, without requiring a surface receptor. Um, and this actually, uh, we've now figured out, this is like really neat. And here it is. So basically what you see here is the outward, the occluded, and the inward. And basically your ibogaine is moving around. And it, it you know, enters the channel of the serotonin transporter and it gets into the channel and then it winds up inside the transporter and it hangs out there. The transporter cannot expel it. It has to wait and for the transporter to be torn down and rebuilt by the cell, which takes about three months. So that's roughly the period of the Ibogaine glow and that's what the sticky Prozac thing is about. Now, Gary Rudnick, who's a world expert on the serotonin transporter, who had Deborah Nash uh, do a presentation at Yale, says this is unique to Ibogaine. No, Ibogaine is the only um, agent so far discovered that actually gets inside the serotonin transporter, becomes lodged there, and can't come out. So that's a pretty significant thing. And when they say, well, you know, it's comparable to all of their drugs, actually, it, it is a unique substance. It's really not comparable to all the drugs. Now, I put this in here to give you an idea. Remember, Ibogaine is affecting a transporter. The transporter is not on the receptor side. The transporter is on the terminal side. 
What other drug does that? Well, here's an endocannabinoid. Endocannabinoid back signals to the glutamate. Here's the cannabinoid receptor on the side of the glutamate terminal telling it you're making too much glutamate. It's making it really hot in here because uh, uh, glutamate is uh, inflammatory. Back in 1982, when a few people discovered that they could use pot to stop uh, intestinal inflammation from our HIV disease, and it didn't really catch on because it was the middle of Nancy Reagan's like war on pot and uh, Ron Reagan, of course, uh, uh, well, she had a, a son that was uh, uh, gay, so you know, she couldn't be totally down on gays, but the gays wanted to be friends with Nancy because they think maybe she'll do something with us so they wouldn't touch pot with a 10 foot pole except in San Francisco. And the important point is that when you take this exogenous cannabinoid, and introduce it, it is going onto the terminal cell, not going through the endocannabinoid part first, and locking in to the terminal cell and telling it to downregulate glutamate. And ibogaine is basically locking into the terminal cell and telling it to upregulate GDNF. We just don't exactly understand how yet but it seems to be uh, part of the same effect that some SSRIs have of bulking up uh, uh, your serotonin um, cells and dendrites. And here is, uh, I can't like say the good stuff without saying the bad stuff. Um, here is where they found out that uh, Ibogaine uh, this is walking away. Uh, this is the thing they discovered that um, noribogaine expresses GDNF, but ATNMC does not. And this is the part where I, I said I was this. This is the bad stuff. Um, and you see that Here's your ibogaine molecule, and it's got into this other channel called the HERG channel, which is just a calcium channel, or no, potassium channel. And you've got to have potassium for your heart so that anything that messes with your potassium channel changes the electron, uh, uh, electrical balance of the cell. And uh, they actually have come up with something that can uh, stop this, and there are many, many drugs like methadone and hydrochloroquine, which are useful drugs and they have to keep using them despite herd blockade, but they would like to see if they can uh, blockade the blockade. Um, so uh, we're waiting to see if there's something that can be given with ibogaine that will uh, suppress this effect without getting rid of the useful thing of ibogaine going into the Serotonin transmitter. Now, here is the 18MC. And remember, 18MC is missing a lot of stuff. It doesn't do serotonin transporter, um, it doesn't do uh, uh, NMDA, um, but uh, it does have this one alpha 3 beta 4 effect. So they're looking at it as a smoking cessation uh, substitute, and they're trying it on methamphetamine and nicotine, and it's very effective for nicotine, and more effective than on methamphetamine, like uh, roughly a 
something on the order of six times more effective for methyl ketamine than Velbutrin. And see here, they're just saying there's this one area, and if you can control this one area, this is typical myelin reductions. If you can control this one area, you'll control everything. Uh, somehow the brain seems a little bigger than that. And here is placebo versus bupropion. Can you see the bupropion here? There's more room in the placebo. It's not even any more effective than placebo. So remember when you're uh, taking it from 10%, which is roughly what this is, 10%, um, to 12.5%, we're still like way off this. This effect, this is like a 60% effect. And here's Glick's famous uh, quote from. Here's his famous quote from the uh, Village Voice. The hallucinations are just an unfortunate side effect, Cliff asserts, explaining that Ibogaine works on the brain like a hybrid of PCP and LSD. Part of the problem is that when you go through this thing, it's so profound, you've got to believe it's doing something. In part, it's an attempt by the person who's undergoing it to make sense of the whole thing. Generally spe speaking, Glick's research on rats has shown Ibogaine dampens the brain's so-called reward pathway, reducing the release of neurotransmitters like dopamine, which caused the highest associated with everything from heroin to sugar, sugary foods. The compound has also been proven to increase production of GDNF, a type of protein that quells cravings and to block the brain's nicotinic receptors, the same spots that are stimulated by tobacco and other addictive substances. Okay, this uh, was written, I believe, around, uh, the end of 2010 or beginning of 2011. That was the end of 2010. And I think they actually already knew 18MC doesn't express GDNF. So I don't know what GDNF is doing in a thing where they're really trying to promote 18MC, but um, I, my um, My main point is that Ibogaine does not tamp down or downregulate the production of dopamine. Ibogaine uh, tends through an acetylcholine pathway, which is just data processing, to uh, lessen the effects of cues uh, so that you don't uh, get they don't trigger the same uh, uh, rush that they did before. Now here is the problem that they have with uh, Ibogaine. This guy is uh, uh, knocked out on a couch having an Iboga experience. And you can see, it's been called a dreamlike experience, that the awake uh, brainwave and the REM brainwave are very similar. And that means you can actually remember dreams. You can't remember stuff that happened in this part of sleep because it's not similar enough to uh, pass over into waking consciousness. You can't wake up and remember deep sleep. You remember the dream you just had. And uh, first thing that the French said when they uh, studied Ibogaine, they said, this is a REM mimetic. It's mimicking REM sleep. Now, this gets into the part about the glutamate and the uh, acetylcholine um, and you see the acetylcholine is right up against the dendrite the glutamate 
which is making heat and not just light, is separated by a spine. And the important thing to know about acetylcholine is that it's manufactured at the mitochondria, which are energy factors. It comes out of the cell and is immediately um, attacked by an enzyme, enzyme that turns it into acetyl and choline. And it's the most efficient energy transfer um, to sustain light-based activity that could possibly be devised. And the important thing to understand is this is the one neurotransmitter that's in acetylcholine. It starts at your eyes and it goes all the way through your nervous system to end up at an end plate that starts muscles moving. So way back at the beginning of time, there was like this protozoa trying to get around the rock and it was able to back up and get around the rock because it could like process light and you know turn surroundings in data figure out from that data how to go around the rock and here um is a, another form of the same thing, which is your cells growing and sprouting dendrites and growing towards another cell. And so you can have a neuro, uh, neurotrophic factor release from a neighboring cell um, that acts on many near, uh, nearby neurons in the absence of formal synaptic connections. Work of a neurotrophic factor that works on its own cell, a neurotrophic factor uh, released in terminals of another cell that acts on synaptic targets of the terminals. The mode of transmission that predominates in the brain, our adult brain and spinal cord, has yet to be determined. But basically, this is the same thing as the paramecium trying to get around the rock. It just, it has to grow um, in the direction it's being signaled to grow. And uh, you make connections and you can have a completely, actually you can rewire the brain. They say, I begin rewire the brain. I begin does rewire the brain. Now, this is also back in the beginning. And this is the New York Times from when we were still doing the Ibogaine project. And you, Ibogaine is activating the top of the spinal cord, which is this, uh, this part here that comes up and ends up uh, up here. Uh, and it's sending ascending bursts into the cerebellum, which uh, basically has the effect of lighting up different things in the cerebellum different memories that you're able to see. And here's how you can see them. You're able to see in the lateral geniculate nucleus, because there's also ascending a burst of activity from the pons. So not just the inferior olive down here into the cerebellum, but from the pons to the lateral geniculate nucleus, and the lateral geniculate nucleus uh, actually can be monitored by the prefrontal cortex, which is awake. And uh, the lateral geniculate nucleus of uh, its pictures in your uh, occiput. So you get like um, a flood of uh, visual material. And uh, you can actually see your, your triggers from your cerebellum which is the part of the brain where you learn to ride a bicycle without losing the ability to have a conversation with a person on the bicycle next to you. Um, and the part of the brain that is commandeered by addiction. Um, Dana, I just want to let you know five minutes past the hour. I'll be done in another five minutes. 
I, 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 I'm sorry. I, I didn't get enough sleep. So, so it's just going to take me a little bit longer. But remember, we don't have a heavy day today. Okay, so, um, and I'm in, I think I have three, three more slides. So um, here's your prefrontal cortex. And ordinarily, your prefrontal cortex tells the cerebellum what to do. We tell the bicycle part of our brain what to do. But when addiction occurs, what happens is that that part of the brain takes over. You're walking down to the gem spa to pick up something you don't remember. And then you get there and you're buying cigarettes. And you suddenly realize when you have to pay for the cigarette, oh, I'm buying cigarettes because you're all on automatic pilot. Well, remember uh, William Burroughs from the previous presentation. William Burroughs was the one who said that your rear brain takes over and runs things. And that's what happens right here. Here's the cerebellum. Well, if you can illuminate this so you can see it, then the prefrontal cortex can reclaim control over the triggers from the cerebellum. Okay, here's, uh, this is really literally is the end, uh, actually. Um, these are some synthetic ibogaine congeners. And I think that you should uh, note, this is from Gilgamesh. Gilgamesh has been unwilling to talk to us. They talk to a lot of other people. They don't seem to want to talk to the AIDS activists. And they're working with the New York Psychiatric Institute, which is a guy named Jeffrey Lieberman, who debated Rick Doblin about psychedelics. He says, I'm not really psychedelic, anti-psychedelic. Well, what he didn't tell you is he's working with Gilgamesh and he has several synthetic ibogaines, which for all we know may get rid of a lot of the psychedelic effects. But the important thing is it's supposed to be safer, I think. And he's not telling anybody about it so that when you have policymakers, Charles Schumer from the Senate trying to get an Ibogaine vote from Rick Doblin, uh, Joe Biden, who already knew about Ibogaine in 1995 when it was, when NIDA was working on it, uh, he, can't get any, he can't get any traction because nobody will even admit they're working on it, right? In other words, the New York Psychiatric Institute is run by the Columbia University Psych Department. But we're having to start a whole new institute to get them to study psychedelics at all. And that we'll talk about a little uh, at the uh, third day. Uh, here, it shows the kind of stuff they're doing. And they do all this like tinkering with the molecule and they end up taking out, see this little part here, Lakshmi? Lakshmi? Yeah. Me? See that little part there? They did, that, that's what they're doing, literally. They're taking one little part out of like one little bond and they have a completely new molecule they can patent. That's the big deal. They want to patent the molecule. Uh, right now, Bruno Rasmus and Chavez wants to sell Ibogaine, regular Ibogaine for $700 a gram because he has somebody in Brazil who will make GMP Ibogaine. But they haven't figured out how to make it cheap enough so that people will buy it instead of stuff that's on the market. And I think a lot of these uh, things will, will not work because Basically, ibogaine comes from a plant, you know, and it's it, in a way it's like cocaine or something, except that it's the anti-cocaine, right? But it still comes from a plant, and ibogaine price is controlled by a market. It's tied in to uh, the produce of a plant, so I don't think they can tie it up the price to thousands of dollars as people are trying to. And here, see, this shows. Uh, this is. This shows it does more than GDNF. This was uh, work done in Uruguay. But see, Dalibor Sames is working with the people, and he's from Colombia, and he's working with the people in um, uh, Uruguay that would not have an Ibogaine conference because they're being told to keep all of this under wraps. And here's uh, um, the ones that have uh, the arrow here, the 
are producing GDNF. And see, this one here is one of these synthetic things. It's got a real low um, index of, uh, uh, this has got really high. This is the one they were working on in a previous slide, uh, 008. This one has a high uh, cardiotoxicity. This is really low. So they can find one that's low. And they have it. They just won't tell anybody. They won't tell the New York State Legislature. It's all being kept under wraps because they want to make a billion dollars. And that is all she wrote. 